All right, so we're going to get started. Uh, uh, the first part is always uh, trying to introduce uh, uh, the um, CME and the MOC uh, content. So the cardiology grand rounds uh, going to again offer uh, uh, CME. Uh, the CME credit for this session, please text uh, 14284 as an SMS message to the number 888-816-4893. For this, you would need an active profile in the Rutgers Cloud CME platform. And if you would want to get also an MOC credit specifically for physicians, uh, please complete the step one. And for this link, which will be again displayed back in the chat box, you would use a room code future 30 to answer the questions. And if you are correctly answering the questions, then you would have uh, the credits uh, for the MOC points directly go into your ABM ID, provided that's existing in your Cloud CME profile. All right, so with that, uh, we come to today's uh, grand rounds. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Robert Burke. Uh, Dr. Burke is uh, known to us because he recently visited uh, us and we are looking forward to seeing his interest for the Director of Structural Imaging Program. So we are uh, really happy that he's going to provide us a perspective today about this field. Uh, Dr. Burke uh, is uh, actually uh, well-known to the Rutgers fraternity. He did his uh, uh, medical school for UMDNJ, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, that was then uh, in 1995. And subsequently, he completed his uh, residency and fellowship at Mayo Clinic Arizona and, uh, and had uh, advanced echocardiography fellowship also at Mayo Clinic Arizona, where I had an opportunity to work closely with him while I was com completing my cardiology fellowship. Subsequently, he has been in leadership role and currently is the director of non-invasive uh, cardiodiagnostic at uh, uh, Honors Health System and also leads uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, research faculty uh, role uh, in the health system there. He has uh, been uh, prolific at the American Society of Echo and, and the American College of Cardiology with faculty roles at the scientific uh, sessions where he's uh, well, well known for leading uh, the faculty presentations. And uh, in addition, he has uh, been uh, extensively contributing uh, to a uh, role in, in, in uh, industry, specifically in the structural intervention research. Um, he has uh, been actually a uh, uh, faculty and also a curriculum uh, program developer for the TAVR. He has been a TAVR proctor uh, with the Meditronic um, and continues to have uh, several roles with the industry in, in developing uh, this field and has been, as a result, also been uh, associated with a research uh, program in structural interventions. Um, he's today going to give us an uh, uh, overview of uh, structural imaging. What does it mean? Where is it going uh, from inception to present and the future? And to join him subsequently after his presentation uh, in the panel discussion would be uh, Dr. Ankur Seti, and also uh, along with uh, him would be Dr. Ashok Chaudhry. Both of them will come together and we'll have hopefully a good discussion on how we look towards this uh, ongoing developments that are happening in the field of structural imaging, where, how do we screen for patients, how do we bring them in the right ways and get the right steps done which is an ongoing of ongoing interest for us here. So with that, uh, I'll bring over Dr. Burke uh, to give his presentation and look forward to also the panel discussion after that. Well, the floor is- Dr. 
Thank you so much for the introduction. You're much too kind. Um, as Partha was saying, you know, we've known one another for longer than we probably want to admit publicly, but uh, it's been really our entire careers for all intents. And, you know, we've both remained very, very interested in echo and non-invasive um, technologies and sort of where that's going to go. So when we both started, none of this existed. So, you know, we had no way of knowing that this was going to be a significant part of our career path or even how to prepare for it because, again, this this wasn't even a real expectation. I mean, there were some things in research and it was really at the nescence of what we now know as structural um, heart uh, therapy. So let me share my screen here and let's get rolling. All right, so when Partho presented this, I was a little bit intimidated. Uh, this is interventional echocardiography from practice to perfection. And that sounds a little bit um, ambitious to say that we're at perfection or that I am personally at perfection. I think that uh, we all would uh, hope to achieve that at some point. So these are my disclosures. I've been faculty and also proctor for Abbott, Edwards, and Medtronic um, within the past couple of years. Prior to that, I've also done some research, although that doesn't apply to this, with uh, Siemens and also with uh, Boston Scientific, but those are things of the past. So what is interventional echocardiography? So when you look at this, the first mention of interventional echocardiography only goes back to 2009. And that was with uh, Dr. Lang and the use of intracardiac echo and imaging tools to help guide non-coronary interventions. So it's a very rapidly evolving field and it does require specific imaging expertise that is outside of what we've typically trained echocardiographers to do. I mean, traditionally our role was, you know, you have a sonographer, images are obtained, you interpret those and you try to make sure that, you know, the quality is good and, you know, things that you do as a director, but really not as much hands-on. However, increasing number of heart interventions really require full-time imaging with echocardiography because we can't see this stuff with fluoro. Now, this has clearly grown. We now actually have fellowship training programs specific to interventional echocardiography, which really couldn't have imagined doing in the past when I did my echo fellowship. So getting back to the title, practice, what is practice? You know, so the application or use of an idea or belief as opposed to theory. So it's something that you have to do really every day. This is something that needs to be routine. And it's not something that can be done casually. So if you're going to talk about interventional echo, I would say that this really needs to be a focus of one's career. It's very difficult to dabble in this. And the problem is that if you don't have people that are really trained, it's very difficult to be consistent. And it does make things more challenging from the interventionalist standpoint, from the operator standpoint, to really get things to go well. Perfection, taking that action that we do on a daily basis and really trying to improve it until we make it as good as we possibly can. So that's really what we're looking at. So every time you're in the case, you really do need to be trying to do a little bit better than the last one. And I think that's a mindset. It's definitely an aspirational goal. I don't think that anybody's ever truly there, but we continue to try to do things a little bit differently and hopefully hone the art of what we do. So I'd like to take you back in time a little bit. As I said, when Partho and I were in training, none of this really existed. But when we talk about catheter-based therapies, you have to go back to 1985 with mitral valvuloplasty. And that was really a game changer for rheumatic valvular heart disease. You know, you could actually take rheumatic mitral stenosis and fix it with valvuloplasty. And we still do that. We still do that. I mean, I'm 
located in Arizona, so we're right across the border from Mexico. So there are folks that still come up and they have rheumatic valvular heart disease that's amenable to valvuloplasty, and we still do that. So not often, maybe a couple of cases a year. On the heels of that, because mitral valvuloplasty was so effective, there was a thought, well, we could also do this for the aortic valve. Now, that is successful, and you can do balloon valvuloplasty, but it's not a very durable uh, therapy. Unfortunately, it's really not something that we can rely on to provide outcomes that we would uh, expect for our patients routinely. We still do use it occasionally for bridging or even for diagnostic slash therapeutic purposes with regard to some of our aortic valve patients. Move forward to 1990, started doing ASD closures. Interestingly, in 1999, the term structural heart disease was actually coined at TCT by Marty Leon. And again, ahead of his time. You know, it's just at TCT, this whole concept of structural heart disease and what could we do? That was the first time that it was reported. And that term has stuck. It's definitely had legs. Getting into commercial use. And I'm going to focus just on what's really available and not just the research side. So we won't go off into uh, too many side branches because the research side for structural heart has been vast. Uh, many different trials that we've enrolled in with devices and therapies that really aren't ever going to make it to market and really from a clinical standpoint shouldn't be a primary focus of what you're trying to get out of this talk. But back in uh, November 2011, we did our first cases and my lab was actually the first one in Arizona to do TAVR. Again, at that time, it was prohibitive risk. These were patients that absolutely no way, no how were you going to do surgery on. They were turned down. They had no options. Go to 2015, we started doing valve and valve treatments with TAVR. 2016, we went to intermediate risk, and 2019, then to low risk TAVR. Low risk isn't exactly what everybody thinks. It's really what is just low STS surgical risk. Again, hopefully not every 40-year-old with bicuspid valve disease. 2013, we started using MitraClip, again, for primary mitral regurgitation, again, in prohibitive risk patients. These were surgical turndowns. In 2019, we had FDA approval to start using MitraClip for secondary mitral regurgitation or functional mitral regurg. 2015, we had the commercial availability of Watchman as the first of the left atrial appendage occlusion device therapies couple of devices here for PFO closure, the left atrial appendage closer devices with both Watchman, which is now the Flex device, uh, the second generation commercially available, and the Amplats or Amulet, uh, which has just been available. So structural heart imaging. Let's go to the guidelines for a little bit. Back in 2013, the TE guidelines had absolutely no mention of interventions outside of the operating room. Been quite a change. Then last year, back in July, uh, Becky Hahn and Mo Sarek, uh, had this, their recommendations for performance of TEE for structural heart interventions. And if you haven't read this, and particularly for the fellows, this is a phenomenal resource to look at all the imaging things that we can do with TEE for structural heart disease. And it's incredibly helpful because there's so much information out there and there's so much nuance. You really do want to be able to look at this. And particularly if you're going to be scrubbing into a case to get an idea of what you're going to be looking at prior to getting in there, this is incredibly helpful. And it's something that I know back in uh, 2011, um, we would have uh, really gone crazy if we had something like this to help guide us back then. So with that being said, let's go back in time a little bit to 2011. This is when we very first started one of our first cases within just a month or so of release. 76-year-old gentleman with known coronary disease, prior bypass, severe aortic stenosis, really a tough situation. So decompensated heart failure, multiple hospitalizations, EF of 25%, and clearly was not a good surgical candidate. He was declined. They were not going to touch him. 
had significant peripheral vascular disease. So while we could get up diagnostic catheters, uh, there was certainly no way that we were going to fit a 20 plus French uh, sheath through the iliofemoral system. And he was going to have to be a transapical approach. He also had this uh, stent to the subclavian, which will come into play momentarily. So pre-TAVR cardiac catheterization, he ended up with another stent. So pre-TAVR echo. This is about the extent of my contribution to the pre-TAVR echo right now. So get the LVOT diameter. That's what we're asked to do. That was the expectation. Now, we also did a CT, and by all rights, this was, you know, just going to be a 23 millimeter valve. It looked like we had everything fine as far as the CT area, the perimeter, all that should have been good. So, transapical approach, we start off. There's a pigtail showing you that you've got a trileaflet valve, you've got some aortic insufficiency. You can see that there are stents in pretty much all the arteries. You can see defibrillator wires. Uh, he's had a lead exchange in the past. So balloon valvuloplasty was performed, 22 by 4 uh, centimeter. Went well. We had a balloon pump in, which uh, for those of you who don't routinely see that, that's the sort of pulses in the background. So had the implant angle. This is all looking good. We're feeling pretty good about ourselves. Go. Rapid pace. Deploy the device. Everything's looking great. A little micro adjustment there to make sure that we're in the right place. Went up smoothly, no issues, hemodynamically, everything looked great. So for those of you who are used to seeing everything from a uh, transfemoral, this looks very strange because we've got catheter going from the apex and then coming up. Implanted device looked okay initially until it doesn't. So Unfortunately, with our balloon pump, we embolized the valve into the left ventricle, spun around for a couple of times. At that time, I am embarrassed to say that I wasn't quick enough to catch an image of that on uh, echo, and it subsequently got caught in the LV outflow tract in reverse and pop shot into the aorta like a uh, cork from a champagne bottle. So, goes in town not causing a lot of trouble. Unfortunately, he ended up in all sorts of trouble hemodynamically, starts to decompensate. We we're able to go and get some wires into it, stabilize the valve, pull it down past the subclavian, which nicely had that stent there so we could see where we were going. Unfortunately, it's facing the wrong direction and it's obscuring blood flow downstream. So we're getting great flow to the brain, but not a whole lot to the uh, rest of the body. They did DSA to see exactly where things are. You can see there's not a lot of blood flow through that device, a little bit around it. So long story short, we're able to go and stent it into place. We got put a balloon inside there, left a wing balloon up. That was our uh, balloon valvuloplasty balloon that was used. This is my other contribution. I showed that there was still flow going downstream without the use of extra contrast. 26 valve was then put in. We had to reaccess the apex on this one. And then the device was in. So this did remarkably well. Now what's painfully missing from all this is much contribution from echocardiography. This is where we started. There wasn't a lot of role for it. And unfortunately, I think that if we had had better echo or a different perception of what we should be doing with echo, things probably wouldn't have gone the way that they did. So this case was written up and presented at Dallas Leipzig was actually a case of the year. So ultimately the guy did very well. He ended up living another five years, ultimately, passed away due to issues with myelodysplastic syndrome. Now, when I say, could we have done better with this? I'd say yes, because we're very comfortable now that if we don't really trust what we're seeing on CT or on angiography, 
we can actually measure the aortic annulus on a 3D volume set. And here, I can show you an example, obtain the volume of the valve. You can make some adjustments. This is specifically with a uh, Siemens system with their easy valve setup. Make some adjustments and you can actually get not only a perimeter, but also an area. And you can get coronary heights. Again, it just takes a little bit of manipulating with the volume. And we've done this and we've correlated this with uh, three Mencio as our comparator. And in this case, they come in within a couple of millimeters of one another and they're basically still the same size. I've taken it to be a habit to actually do annulus sizing on all of our cases as a confirmatory tool. Now, there are some times when volumes don't look great on TE and you may not trust it all that well, but making a habit out of doing this has enabled me to really provide this as a service and a backup in the event that we need to find something out urgently. So best example of this, a simple valvuloplasty. We've done hundreds of these. We had a patient who was scheduled for BAV because of severe aortic stenosis. Hard to say was the aortic valve the primary driver for his symptoms or not. High risk haver, ischemic cardiomyopathy, recent left main LED stenting, class four heart failure, AS, MR. We weren't very gung ho about taking him to Taver as an upfront strategy, just because we weren't sure that we were going to have benefit for him. So here we go. You can see a volume of the valve. You can see that the tri leaflet valve is not opening very well. Have a basic 2D showing that the LVOT diameter is 2.5, so a relatively large valve. So here goes the valvuloplasty. And you can see that that balloon got shot out. There was one slight little hiccup there with maybe some atrial activity, not really sure, but it didn't stay in place. What I'd like to point out here is that immediately afterward, you're seeing valve leaflet flying around in the breeze. Generally not a very reassuring thing. So immediately afterward, there's some aortic insufficiency. This is incredibly misleading. And again, from the echocardiographer standpoint, I think you need to be very, very mindful that this is incredibly eccentric. What we actually have is a flail leaflet. The D cell time, the pressure half time here was only 205 milliseconds. And you can see, I have to get this from a mid-esophageal position. Very atypical, not what you would routinely be taught. You know, this is not the kind of thing where you're going to get the information if you go into a transgastric view and then look at it. So you need to be very mindful of where is the flow going and how do I actually direct my uh, CW to optimize that. So lots of technical things that you need to keep in mind when you're doing intraoperative echo so that you can actually get the answers because it's not always what's going to be in the textbook, and it's not our quote-unquote standard for a lot of this. So here, you can see that the leaflet is flying around in the breeze, and this patient has acutely decompensated. We actually ended up doing a valve sizing, pretty large valve, and we're able to summarily put a taver in because dynamically he had crashed and we weren't, weren't able to do anything. Uh, rapid pacing didn't help with AI. You really can't do anything with a uh, intraortic balloon pump. So thankfully we were able to go and place a taver and stabilize him. He ended up being in the unit for several days, but he did go home on post-op day five. So he actually had a great result with a very unanticipated taver. Now, as a result, We've gone into all of our valvuloplasty with the assumption that we may need to do TAVR. So we try to do them on TAVR days. And, you know, knock on wood, we have not had to do this twice. But, you know, you, you see this once and it does definitely uh, change your perspective on things. So other areas that we've been able to do, the next thing that we're approved was for mitral valve, or was for valve and valve therapy. And again, with ECHO, we can get pretty much everything that we need and get very similar data compared to CT. 
This can be an issue with patients who have significant renal insufficiency, contrast allergies, et cetera. This is a patient who had a 27 millimeter uh, magna. You can see that the true ID, the stent ID is uh, 26. So that's going to help to determine what size valve we're going to put in there. In this case, it'd be a 29 S3. Now, when you're doing your TE, the baseline here is trying to figure out, well, what is the problem? I think on the biplane, initially, you can see that there looks to be a flail leaflet. And I think that even before we throw color on this, you know that there's going to be an issue there. Now, I tend to use a lot of biplane imaging. Um, it helps to put a better picture into my head. And also, when we start guiding catheters, it's really helpful to know where the tips of things are so that you're not being surprised and losing things in a 3D space when you're dealing with planar imaging. So in this case, you can see that when we talk about the mitral valve leaflets and with a surgical valve, I'll use my pointer here, we'll consider this anterior. Again, anterior leaflet would traditionally be up here. This is your aortic valve, so that's roughly a 12 o'clock position. You have a lateral and a medial leaflet, and it looks like this medial leaflet has ruptured and is actually flail. So that's going to give you an idea of where the regurgitation is likely to go. You can see the uh, left atrial appendage is up here at about that uh, 9, 30, 10 o'clock position. So your dual view here, you can again see your flail leaflet. You can look at it also from the ventricular aspect. Now, interestingly, when you look at this, it's sort of difficult to see on 3D, where is that jet? Because it doesn't really go far back into the left atrium. It actually has much more of a coanda effect where it goes laterally and then rolls around the perimeter of the uh, left, atrial, uh, left atrium. Again, here, when we're going to try to quantify this with PISA, you can see that I've done a baseline shift and the Nyquist limit here is 43. I routinely make a point of trying to get that Nyquist limit and the baseline shift to around 40, mostly because when we have that, if you understand the math, you can have a radius, the PISA radius of over one centimeter. You should be in the severe category with regard to mitral regurgitation. And it does simplify things and keeps things moving a little bit quicker uh, when you're trying to find, does somebody have severe mitral regurgitation or not? Again, with a flail leaflet, quantification is a little bit redundant, but I tend to just stick with the discipline of trying to quantify as best I can. So here, a couple of things we've done. We get a mean gradient through the valve of six millimeter mercury, probably more related to flow and a high flow situation than truly stenotic. You can see that we've got a mitral PISA radius that's over a centimeter. And also we have an MRVTI. In this case, a little bit underestimated. You look at this, the VMAX is only four meters per second. Peak gradient is in the 60s. We're definitely going to underestimate this just because of angles. Again, not too worried about really quantifying what the volume is in a situation like this one, but the ERO is still going to be over one centimeter squared, and we know pretty well what we're navigating already. This is probably the single most important view that you want to get when you're navigating mitral regurgitation. You need to interrogate the pulmonary veins. Pulmonary vein flow reversal and looking at all the pulmonary veins, not just the left superior and the right superior pulmonary vein, but all of them. Because when you have eccentric mitral regurgitation, this is not going to necessarily provide a uniform pressure gradient. Um, I remember once upon a time, people talking about unilateral uh, pulmonary edema with mitral regurgitation. And I thought that's got to be nuts. You know, you put the high pressure inside the left atrium, you back it up, it's going to be high pressure everywhere. Well, I've been humbled by looking at more and more mitral valve disease in my career and finding that, yes, there are times when flow in one lung is significantly different than flow in another and that there's significant flow reversal on one side that you don't see on the other. And yeah, you can really explain unilateral pulmonary edema because of eccentricity of the regurgitation. So when you see this sine wave flow like this, you know that you have severe regurgitation 
and you're really impeding the ability for that lung to actually empty during systole. Incredibly important stuff. You see, this is the left superior, and this is actually the right superior pulmonary vein. So a couple little things here, trying to decide, do we have height within the left atrium to make our septal puncture and do it safely? Three and a half is what we typically like to have for these valve and valve procedures. So made a couple of different things. You can see the 2D imaging for this is really going to limit what your sizes are. You see, I've got 21 millimeters. We know that this should be a 26 millimeter inner diameter. I was able to get the aorta mitral angle at 131 degrees, which is basically the same as what we had on CT. Again, that's important to look at what's going to be the potential neo-LVOT and whether or not there may be issues with obstruction. Again, valve and valve procedures are much more predictable than things like valve and ring. So on the 3D imaging, I can actually replicate much of what we have with CT and what you might be doing with 3 Mencio. Again, my diameters here about 26 to 27 millimeters and you have to do some finessing with uh, gain settings and stuff to get this but again that's exactly what we have on ct and what you would expect from the valve and valve app so we'll go through the procedure relatively quickly here this view here on the left i'm actually looking at what the lvot and the neo lvot is going to look like always nice to see a lack of a septal bulge here so you have less concerns about causing obstruction to outflow uh, when you put a new valve inside there. So moving on, this is our transeptal. My point here is always, always image this in biplane. That way you're going to know where the tip of that needle is. You always want to know where it's going to go because in a single plane, you don't know if you're going to be pointing toward the aorta inadvertently. And the last thing in the world that you want to do is guide a septal puncture into the aorta if you can at all help it. So biplane imaging, critically important. Once we've gotten through, uh, we actually used a balus in this situation. Things are looking good. We always do a septostomy and have a balloon septostomy in order to allow for better control of the device and again we're just about three and a half centimeters there so we're looking very good with our septal guide you can see the agilis catheter i like to go back as far as i can within the left atrium so that we get a perspective with the agilis catheter to determine what is anterior what's posterior what's medial and what's lateral much like what we would do with a mitral case and here we can get the uh, use the agilis catheter to cross into the left ventricle, simplifies things greatly. And then we're going to go and advance our whole system and actually the valve. You can see that going into the mitral valve. Everything is set up and then we're going to get ready to deploy. And that one's still. And this is deployment of the valve. You can see it expanding. The S3 is opening up. Initial view looks pretty good. There's definitely some regurg related to the wire. Get the wire out and reassess. And what you're looking at is really trivial mitral regurgitation. We also go back down into a transgastric just to make sure that there's no uh, dynamic gradient uh, subvalvular. Subsequently, look at the atrial septum to make sure there's no issues with right to left shunting, and there's not. And ultimately, our uh, mean gradient across this valve now is two and a half, uh, with no evidence of any significant mitral regurgitation. And that is our final result. And she was pretty photogenic on this one. Again, no significant mitral regurg. Another look here, you can see that there's absolutely no issue with any compromise on the uh, neo-LVOT. The aortic valve is opening well. You can also actually look at the aortic valve with M mode and look for any pre-closure or anything like that, like you would with Hokum. Uh, clearly, in a case like this, not too much of an issue. So the next technology that we're presented with is MitraClip. And... 
you know, that has been probably the biggest challenge for imaging. And it's an issue because of uh, some of our things with getting physician coverage for the imaging. Basics here, you know, I sort of wish that we were actually in a lecture hall so that I could pick on some of the uh, fellows, but they'll they'll be uh, absolved of that responsibility. First thing that you want to look at with any mitral valve case is why is the valve leaking? So this is obviously a patient who has a decreased EF, huge atria, so biatrial enlargement. Co-optation plane looks relatively flat on this patient, so it doesn't look like it's all tethered. It's not just a simple dilation. This looks like there's a lot of annular dilation, and as such, we're not getting a very eccentric MR jet. Now, with our mitra clip, we have a very different goal for our septal height. You know, traditionally it was try to get around four, we're probably four and a half or five centimeters that we'd like to have with our septal height in order to avoid problems with steering and navigating once you get into the left atrium and being able to navigate well above the mitral valve and make all those adjustments that you possibly can before crossing into the left ventricle. So that's our septal guide. Again, five centimeters, four and a half or five centimeters. Very broad jet, as you might expect. Looks like, again, this is more of a, an annular dilation problem than anything else, which you often see with atrial fibrillation. Biplane imaging is very helpful. Quantification, again, you really have to trace the MR and not what you think it would like to be. It's not always parabolic, and particularly with these functional patients, it's often not parabolic. Get a mean gradient so that we know that we're not going to have to worry so much about uh, stenosis afterward. And measuring the posterior leaflet because you really need to know what size clip you can tolerate and how much you can put inside there and really get a grasp. Obviously, use as much of that posterior leaflet as you possibly can to help stabilize the mitral valve and also create a little bit of a bridge or uh, sort of a, an annuloplasty type effect. Always look at the left atrial appendage for clot. Look at the pulmonary veins for some flow reversal. You can see here we're on the right. Now what I did is I go from the left roughly around 60-ish. You can clock around anteriorly and actually see the right superior and inferior pulmonary veins in one view. I found this to be a very useful time saver. Sometimes you'll see a third in there from the uh, right middle lobe and you can pulse that as well if you need to. So again, biplane imaging for your septal guide, you wanna make sure you're doing that, make sure they don't go into the uh, aorta. Lots of paperwork if you do that. So again, Bayless wires across. Now you can see that there was a little bit of hold up here with the initial catheter. Let me get my... And then that starts to slide and you get rid of that tenting. Again, biplane imaging through the mitral and the LV. Had a volume there. You can also get an LV volume and an LV EF if you want to do that. Now, this is actually the heart as it lays in the chest. So you can see that the mitral valve, the bicom, the bicommissural view is sort of at about a 45 to 60 degree angle. Anterior is up to the right. If we look here. And then the posterior is down there. Aortic valve is up here, tricuspid valve is there. So have a slightly better biplane image on what is a bicommissural view here, or the bicom view. Cut straight through it to get a sense of what our actual posterior leaflet's gonna be at that place. So then we're just gonna guide imaging into, now this is one of those things where I left this in because you might notice that we have company inside the right atrium that wasn't there before. So in spite of heparinizing before we even make a stick with about 5,000 or so, sometimes clot will form. So this is incredibly important. This is why when you're guiding a procedure, you really can't be asleep at the wheel. You can't leave, go get a cup of coffee, come back once uh, they're ready for you. You do have to remain vigilant throughout the process. So we're able to go and actually identify that there was thrombus, take an aspiration catheter up there, aspirate that. You can see this plot well within the volume. 
once that was removed, then we could go ahead with advancing our actual guide catheter and then subsequently the clip delivery system. And we can follow that as it moves through. There's our steerable guide catheter. And then we get our clip delivery system. You can see the clip, the tip of it, always watch that in biplane. You don't want to get that caught inside the left atrial appendage or advance into something and create a pericardial effusion. So then we have our clip in biplane, and you can see how you really don't see all of it with simple biplane imaging. And that's why volumes in 3D can be very, very helpful. So in this case, we have a 3D volume, and you can see where your trajectory is. Taking this as your X plane, your Y plane, and then this is your Z plane, that's your depth. So X is gonna be your horizon, Y is your altitude, and Z is your depth. Always creating that biplane image in 3D so that you know exactly where the clip is gonna go so you understand the trajectory and you can actually anticipate where you're gonna land within the left ventricle, hopefully keeping everything nice and straight. So they advanced into the ventricle, just getting below the level of the leaflets. And then you're gonna to wanna to be able to really focus and sort of zoom in, now this is all rezzed, and actually see the leaflets tapping on the arms so that you get an idea of whether or not you've got a good position. I go back to 2D imaging for this just because our volume, our frame rates are much better than the volume rates. Looks like we're in a pretty good position here. <coughs> Pardon me. So you can see the grippers drop. And we have access to both. You've definitely gotten the anterior and posterior leaflets there. You can see how they come up and over the arms, even at 60 degrees. Definitely have some mitral regurgitation. Looks like most of that is coming lateral to the clip. Didn't really like that. Opened up, moved a little bit laterally. Again, see the leaflets tapping on the arms. Drop the grippers. Looks like we actually got a better investment on the posterior leaflet this time. And you can start to see how we pull the anterior and posterior leaflet together and sort of create a bridge, a tissue bridge, which is very helpful. Now you can see that we've got less mitral regurgitation than we did before. Tighten that down all the way. Gradient here is perfectly fine. It's only in the two, two and a half millimeter mercury. You can see how you have a dual orifice mitral valve now, sort of our owl's eye. And there is some dropout over the anterior leaflet because I'm a little bit deep inside the mid-esophageal. We're looking up, and what's happening is that you're going to get shadowing. So if you need to worry about the anterior leaflet, you need to pull the probe up a little bit to look down on it. Again, not a lot in the way of mitral regurgitation. I prefer 2D when we're dealing with this anyway. You can see the pulmonary vein flow patterns have become normalized. Really not much in the way of any regurgitation and getting ready to release. We only had two and a half millimeters left of that 14 millimeter uh, posterior leaflet, so we have great tissue investment. And this again is a volume looking at the uh, clip for delivery and release. You can see how really things did not move much at all, which is great. It tells you that your trajectory and everything was really what you wanted it to be. Relatively trivial mitral regurgitation, that all looks great. We're gonna look as we cross, looking for any right to left shunting, no issues there. You can see that really nice tissue bridge. And again, we don't have the shadowing from the clip delivery system anymore. So you don't have that dropout on the anterior leaflet. And this looked great. Overall, wonderful result there with mitral. And you can see that with the uh, continuous uh, spectral Doppler, you see this all looks like it's left to right shunting and nothing really right to left. So final gradient, three millimeter mercury, pretty much physiologic. So again, from our practice to hopefully perfection, we've taken on some more complicated things like a chordal rupture. So this is a 92 year old gentleman, sat on the golf course, passed out, ended up in the ICU. He's on pressors, 
he gets TEE done, and this is what they found. So he ruptured acutely. This is a very vigorous gentleman. He was vacationing from Pittsburgh, out playing golf, which was his favorite thing in the world to do. Takes care of his own home, completely independent up until this. So very quickly, we've got a flail gap. You know that this is severe. We don't have to get too fancy about that one. So you can see some cords there flopping in the breeze. We're able to go, this is an older one, so it's a smaller clip. We're able to get in. And with one clip, we had a significant improvement here. Normalization pulmonary venous flow. Nice little tissue bridge, still a little bit of movement. I think if this were today or if this had happened yesterday, we probably would have used a larger clip and we probably would have used a second clip along with it. But the results were pretty good. He ended up uh, living another four years after this, uh, went back home to Pittsburgh where he continued to shovel snow and do everything else. Um, actually just passed away uh, earlier this year. I've been in touch with his son um, pretty much every Christmas ever since then. Left atrial appendage in involvement. Now this is probably the most common procedure that all of you are gonna see with regard to structural heart I won't belabor this one. Again, transeptal, please biplane imaging. Measurements of the appendage. What we're gonna do is everything is 2D driven. And with this, if they're in sinus rhythm, you really want this to be done at end systole if at all possible, because it should be the largest that the uh, appendage is going to be. We can also make those measurements on 3D volume. And we can even get an orifice area like you would with uh, three mencio. You can see here that we're using the circumflex as our landmark to get an idea of where the virtual annulus is for our uh, watchman device. Here you can see that we're initially inside the pulmonary vein, have to come back out, go into the left atrial appendage. Angiography is incredibly helpful because. Determining depth with TEE still remains a bit of a challenge. We oftentimes underestimate that. Sizing is often done with both TEE and also with angiography. You can see the deployment of the device here on the left. My deployment sequence on the right with echo is a lot shorter because it's only a couple beat capture. The ultimate result looked great, minimal shoulders. And we would do all of our sizing afterward with echo in order to make sure that this is appropriately compressed, part of our pass criteria. And this ended up basically being around 20 for all of our measurements. So it was excellent. And you can do those also with 3D if you need to, because sometimes biplane imaging just is not your friend with these uh, Watchman devices. So one quick thing on complications. What I draw your attention to here is that we've got the right atrium. You're actually looking at the left atrium here, the atrial septum. This is SVC, right atrium here. You can see this, the crista has really a cord-like appearance to it. And sometimes that fan is much more prominent than in other patients. This can be a real gotcha if you're twirling catheters inside there, they can get caught. In this case, we were getting ready to do a live case for a mitra clip. Had some difficulties with uh, catching the, uh, the septum very well, but as we were doing it, developed an acute pericardial effusion. Not what we we're anticipating. As Soon as you see an effusion, you wanna go transgastric. You can see that there's a significant diffusion there. And you can see that this is relatively gelatinous. You can see that that is starting to clot. We're able to help guide placement of our pigtail catheter here from transgastric, showing it go up and around and help to drain the pericardial effusion. So we went from a live case of mitroclip to a live case of how to navigate a pericardial effusion all in one fell swoop. So with that, I will finish so we don't get too far off. 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Bob, sir, for the very basic um, overview and, and also the uh, interesting uh, evolution of the field. Let's bring back our um, panelists, uh, Ashok and Ankur. And um, uh, let, let, let's start with Ashok. Ashok, I know that uh, uh, you've had this solution uh, here as well. Um, the, the imaging plays a very critical role, but I believe that um, looking at the pro projection of how structural, um, uh, structural field is growing, do you think we are doing enough to train people? Um, and, and, and what do you think is, the, is a need? Uh, very few people are trained in structural imaging. I feel like if you, if you do a survey, um, more people with general cardiology are doing the structural imaging for everyone. But is that the legitimate evolution or do you think this needs a, a little bit more fitness uh, as, an, as, a, as, we, as we evolve? Um, first, I, uh, that was a really uh, excellent uh, um, synopsis of a lot of uh, interesting, complicated cases that he had. Thank you very much for sharing all those slides with us. To answer your question, I think um, it is getting more and more evolved and specialized. Uh, I, I don't think we are in the era where all we need is a 3D uh, analyst measurement for a tower. I think um, it's, it's getting more and more complicated. We, we have uh, different, uh, even in the mitral area, it's uh, now we have atrial functional MR, ventricular functional MR, you have uh, your <coughs> clips in A2 area, A3, A1, then you have this complex paravalve relief, and then we didn't even uh, talk about tricuspid interventions and all those trials, and so I think um, I think first uh, we we do need specific training in structural heart, just like uh, for interventions, just like we have one here, and not only it should focus on echo, but it, it has to be multimodality imaging um, uh, to get a, a, a understanding of, of of what we actually do in the cath lab or the OR. It's a combination of CT. MR, um, hemodynamics, uh, and, and, and speaking the same language as the interventional of the surgeon. But if we just focus on one sort of imaging like TEE, I think we are missing a bigger picture there. So um, it's, yes, it's, it's, it's gonna be more years, uh, but it, it has, it is, I don't see any other way other than to be hands-on and provide a comprehensive training like the one you're envisioning here with CT, MR, TEE, getting into the cases. Uh, and doing more and more. Um, and I think a lot of programs are offering it, which is great, but, but there's a lot of, a uh, lot more to do. And we learn as we do these cases. And I'm, I'm going to go to Ankur. Ankur, what can we do to excite uh, more people to do uh, imaging? Because I think everybody wants to be the implanter. So how can we get, the field is not going to move if we have more implanters and no images, right? What do you think we should do? I uh, I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> I'm not a major. I don't know. Uh, but I, I think uh, uh, actually it's a great talk. I think at one point I was confused if I was an echo talk or an intervention talk. So that is the start. Uh, uh, I think uh, real real question is it comes out to the ownership. Uh, uh, and I don't know about training. I think anybody who's willing to put time in day in and day out and is ready to show us that you can and is being part of the team can possibly do this. Uh, and uh, I think his real question is ownership. I, I order teas all the time and I, I don't know how many times it happens that the question which was asked of was not answered on TE because it wasn't looked into and it's like the same thing going back to uh, a few years ago when there were a lot of diagnostic cat people who don't do intervention they will send you pictures to see if you can do pci and you can't tell anything because the pictures weren't taken with the intent to fix the lesion because lesion wasn't opened up it, i think same thing is true for the interventional echocardiography uh, you can take 100 pictures of MR and not show me how to fix it. Happens all the time. Uh, and also, echocardiographer with the intent to find the solution 
uh, not just a problem. Uh, so I think it comes with the personality. Uh, I don't know how to how to cultivate that in anybody. <laughs> Bob, do you have an answer? Well, it's a lengthy answer. Uh, realistically, what we need is really to train echocardiographers in much the same way that we train interventionalists. They need to have time in the lab. They need to be really elbow to elbow with the proceduralist, with the implanters to understand what is happening. You know, it's not merely a matter of being the staff photographer, which I jokingly refer to myself as. You need to be a co-partner with the implant. You need to know how the devices are gonna work. You need to know how they behave. When I'm in a mitra clip case, um, you know, I'm asking, well, how much M do you have on? How much have you taken off? You know, are, we've got a little bit more of a medial dive than I'd expect. How much M is on right now? Do you have five or six o'clock? You know, where are you? And trying to figure that stuff out, but you need to understand the technology, you need to understand the equipment. And so training not only has to happen during you know, our fellowship programs, but also the device companies need to make a point of reaching out and training people and making sure that this education is available because, you know, the vast majority of people that are out there in practice, as we've seen, grow up with this. You know, our fellows are in a great position because they are growing up with this. This is sort of second nature and they're familiar with it but not every one of our fellows is gonna go into interventional echo. And we've got a lot of echocardiographers and anesthesiologists that are out there that need to understand these things and need to understand where we're coming from with regard to getting the best images. And something is quote unquote simple as you know, left atrial appendage occlusion, you really do need to have an excellent sense of where you're making those measurements and being able to get images that really mean something so that you're not just sort of shooting in the dark. That's uh, great. So I'm going to come to a second point and that's uh, radiation. Do you think we protect ourselves adequately? Um, I, I, I would, and how would you, I've heard about a lot of interventional measures uh, getting undue radiation and developing skin cancers. And, and there's been a document recently from ASC what do you do, Robert, for protecting from for radiation? So the most important thing is just laying off on fluoro when we're doing procedures. So really, that is a it's a constant discussion with your interventionalist, you know, whoever the implanter is. Really, not relying on fluoro as much as relying on echo, particularly with our longer procedures like mitral and. We always use additional lead. We've got shielding. We've got a little drape that goes around the head of the, the patient, and that comes down. We can also have a lead shield that we can go and put in between us, and that does help. The interventionalists, we have multiple options right now, like Protega, that are actually good enough that you can, in practice, not even have to wear lead and do standard interventions. We are much further along the line with regard to radiation safety for the interventionalists, for the proceduralists, uh, compared to where we are for echo and anesthesia. Although that is part of what's in development uh, within those companies to provide additional shielding for our echocardiographers and our anesthesi anesthesiologists. And that's critical because when you're at the head of the bed, if you're not being very diligent, you have an incredibly high exposure and that's not something that you can take lightly because if you're going to spend hours in the lab, you can, within the course of just a day or two, accomplish, you know, from a radiation exposure standpoint, what a very busy interventionalist will get over the course of a week or two. So you have to be very mindful of that. So it, it's a big part of radiation safety, and that's critically important. Any other questions, Ashok, Ankur? No, I think... Uh... I, I'd have just one final c comment with the with the T guided procedure. I think I'm going to ask uh, if the real issue is, and I'm going to just say it. Uh, uh, whenever they say it's not about money, it's about money. It's a saying, right? So I think it's also about the reimbursement. Uh, and 
what is the creative way we can solve this issue by reimbursing somehow the imaging colleague of ours in these long procedures uh, in terms of RVU or some kind of, I, I know there are different, uh, I don't know what does Honor Health do. I know of how big other hospitals do it. So I don't know, uh, do you, uh, Bob, you have a comment on that? I think that may be one way to kind of compensate on their time uh, uh, because uh, it feels like they just did a TE, but it was like a four hour long TE. Right. So, you know, the, the simplest answer would actually be really with CMS to make this as a co-implanter and like a second scrub. If that happened, all of a sudden the RVUs balance out really well and it's not a problem. That would be the simplest thing for CMS to do. And if ACC could magically make that happen, it would be a wonderful thing. I don't see that happening because it would be a very big ask as far as actual cost uh, to the systems, but that would very quickly level the playing field and make it much more attractive for echocardiographers or non-invasive docs to do the procedure or even have some of our interventionalists decide, you know, I can do both of these <laughs> trade off, you know, well, trade off with one of their partners and rather than doing the clip, they could every other clip they image, who knows? There are options. Um, as it stands, however, we don't have that. I don't anticipate that's going to be the case. And then it becomes an issue of how invested is your system in supporting this procedure and supporting imaging and really providing either some kind of stipend or something along those lines that says, okay, this is worth X RVUs or however they want to do it in order to balance the lack of productivity because quite simply, you're not gonna be product productive in a cath lab compared to reading echoes sitting at a workstation. Some places have done it that the interventional echocardiographer is employed by the invasive side and they are part of that cost center and taking it away from non-invasive and that's tend to work out okay with their budgeting but every system has its own answer uh, but some of them really don't have an answer and it's left to anesthesia and then we really i think we put our anesthesia colleagues into a very difficult situation to provide everything for everybody all the time. Yeah, so uh, could you answer your question? So at least for our system here, I have fought very hard uh, so that in the future, whenever we're going to have structural imaging position, there'll be a completely separate uh, list, uh, set of expectation for RVUs. So that has been agreed upon. And because you cannot justify otherwise, because you cannot just ask for the same um, MGMA uh, cutoffs, uh, so there has to be different scaling. So we have been able to advocate for that. So hopefully that will uh, remain attractive in addition to, of course, the uh, stipend and uh, whatever is need necessary. So, but, but this remains um, uh, a challenging question, but maybe one uh, question, which is a quick one, where do you guys see ice? Because now ice is becoming a hot commodity and uh, there is a lot of hype around it. I believe there are certain places it may not work well. Some places it could really work well. It's a quick reaction from um, uh, you all. We have not yet invested in ICE. We we have something that we are going to get an ICE system hopefully soon, a 3D with the 3D capability, 3D ICE. Um, um, I have just used plain by plain ICE, uh, I mean, uh, plain 2D ICE, not 3D ICE. I've seen a lot of work being done. So reactions, uh, uh, maybe we just go from three, uh, three of you. What do you think, Bob? And so, you know, I've, I've done 3D ice. I've used the volume ice uh, that Siemens put out initially. They, I had a, a research protocol going with that for looking at mitral. Doesn't do a great job with mitral. Um, if you cross over into the left atrium, it's wonderful for uh, watchmen and left atrial appendage. Where I think ice, volume ice can be very helpful is actually more tricuspid than anything else because you can get a really great on cost view. The older version that Siemens had was not a true um, volume. It was helical. And so you really couldn't work with biplane the same way. So very limited from that standpoint. 
I think the newer matrix technologies are going to be much, much better because you can develop true biplane and make measurements and all that stuff. I think that would be helpful, but I think tricuspid would be the best area for ice technology and probably again, running from the groin and having our interventionalists run it. I've done it from the IJ and that was actually my protocol. It's doable, but I think it causes a great deal of anxiety from um, my interventional colleagues looking at a non-invasive guy twirling a catheter inside the right atrium and wondering what I'm going to perforate next. I haven't perforated anything, but, you know, uh, it's always a concern and you have to be very, very mindful. Of course, PFOs and other things, are obviously. Yeah, I, I think right off the bat, PFOs, AST, even Watchmen, if you can get into the uh, left atrium. I would the, never do a PFO with ice. You would never do it? Cost them. <laughs> it, well, I, the thing is, it, it's, it's a cost. It costs you money to do ice. It costs you nothing to do TEE. And if you're looking at the, the, the balance for the lab, you're infinitely better off with TEE if you can get that information. Yeah, you, can, you can look at another one that you, for you need, like, you know, uh, anesthesia cost. Yeah, and you, get, and you, you need time you get paid for anesthesia, for that. time for lab. You get paid you for general for, anesthesia. Uh, Oh, you're talking about, I thought you were talking about total amount paid by the system. Okay. As a health system. All right. <laughs> you can get paid for it. That's so this, will be, uh, this is going to be a nice debate for us. For uh, We'll have a, like a nice 20 <laughs> minutes debate with some new, I think it's exciting. So we'll, we'll continue to, um, uh, yeah, we have not done a lot of ice. And the last one, I was looking at your pictures. Those are not Phillips. What were no, you? No, that's Siemens. Yeah, so I was seeing. So you, you, you. So your lab is more is Siemens invested in Siemens. Mostly, um, we're we're almost all Philips at this stage in the game. But for structural, just from the knobology and being able to jump from one thing to another, from a biplane to a volume and back, it's like that, you know. Because if you want to get into multiplane within Epic right now, it's multiple screen taps to get back and forth to actually be able to go and deal with multi-plane reconstruction. Whereas with the SC, with the Siemens, it's just one button and you've got multi-plane reconstruction. So it's much faster if you're gonna make measurements and that kind of stuff. And, and we did not cover the more important, the most important is not just guiding, but patient selection and doing all those imaging upfront so that you can make the decision which requires oh, yeah. a lot of work and particularly for the protocols and all the studies that are happening. So there's a lot of uh, work uh, there for a structural measure, and uh, I think this is going to be an interesting evolution. So thank you very much, uh, Bob, Ashok, and thank you uh, I think uh, we'll continue to do this on an annual basis because I think this is an exciting area, and we look forward to the future of uh, all the technologies that are coming in. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Oh, I wanted to make uh, sure that uh, you had the room code correctly. The room code was... 14285. Text, please text 14285 to 888 816 4893. Thank you all. Good night. Good night.